In this video, we're going to go over the halogenation of alkenes and also the halohydrin formation reaction. So let's start with cyclohexene. And let's react it with Br2, bromine. Each bromine atom has three lone pairs attached to it. Now the double bond is the nucleophile, and it's going to attack the electrophile, which is bromine, expelling a bromide ion in the process. And also this bromine attacks the double bond as well. And so what we're going to get is a cyclic bromonium ion intermediate. This intermediate has a positive charge. Now the other bromide ion it now has four lone pairs, and so it has a negative charge. And so it's going to attack this carbon from the back, causing this bond to break. And so the product is going to have two bromine atoms added across the double bond with anti-addition. So this is one stereoisomer that we can get. We could also get the enantiomer as well. So we get a racemic mixture of products. And so that's the mechanism for the halogenation of alkenes. Go ahead and try this example. Let's say we have cis-2-butene, and we wish to react it with bromine using dichloromethane as a solvent. What are the products that we can get in this reaction? So we know this is an anti-addition reaction, and so the bromine will add across the double bond, one being on the wedge and the other on a dash. And we're also going to get the enantiomer as well. So this reaction will give us two products. We get a racemic mixture or a pair of enantiomers. Now what if we have, let's say, trans-2-butene instead of cis-2-butene? How will that affect the stereochemistry of the products? Well, we know that one bromine atom is going to be on the wedge, and the other is going to be on the dash, as always, since it's an anti-addition reaction. Now, we're going to draw this another way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this bond this way, well, first, let me redraw this uh, molecule. I'm going to draw it like this. So right now, we have a bromine atom on the wedge that's coming out of the page and one on the dash that's going into the page. So what I'm going to do is, first, I'm going to rotate this bond 180 degrees. So now it looks like this. So since I rotated the methyl group, the bromine atom that's going into the page has to rotate 180 degrees out of the page. So now it's on the wedge. Therefore, these two structures are equivalent to each other. Now, if I draw the other product, which will look like this, this product is equivalent to this product. Now, notice that these two products are meso compounds. Notice that they have an internal plane of symmetry. So therefore, these two compounds are identical compounds. They're exactly just the same. So for this reaction, where we have a trans-2-butene reacting it with bromine, that's going to give us only one product as our answer. Whereas if we have cis-2-butene with Br2, we get two products as the answer. So you need to watch out for meso compounds. Now let's work on another example. 
So this time we have trans to pentene. And let's react it with bromine. Go ahead and discuss the stereochemistry of this reaction. So just like before, where we had trans 2 butene, we're going to have a bromine on the wedge and one on a dash. So this is equivalent to this structure. So notice that we do not have a meso compound this time. The reason being is we have a methyl group on the right and an ethyl group on the left. So even though we have a trans alkene, because it's an unsymmetrical alkene, we can't get meso compounds. So we're going to get two products, in this case, a pair of enantiomers. So whenever you have a cis alkene and you react with Br2, you're going to get a pair of enantiomers. If you have a trans alkene, it depends on if it's if there's symmetry or not. So if the trans alkene is symmetrical, then you're going to get meso compounds. If the trans alkene lacks symmetry, then you're going to get a pair of enantiomers. Now let's go over the halo hydrogen reaction. So let's say we have one methyl cyclohexene and we're going to react it with Br2 and H2O. So go ahead and try this problem. So let's go over the mechanism. So here's our Br2 molecule. And we know the alkene will attack the electrophile, expelling a bromide ion. And bromine will also attack the alkene. So just like before, we're going to get this cyclic intermediate ion. So it's going to have a plus charge and two lone pairs. Now, I want you to understand the resonance structures that are associated with this bromonium ion. So let's review the mechanism again. But this time, let's take it step by step. So imagine a double bond attacking the bromine atom, expelling the bromide ion. Where should we put the bromine atom? Initially, I would put it on a secondary carbon so that I can get a tertiary carbon cation. Now this lone pair can attack that carbon cation, giving us this resonance structure, which is the bromonium ion. And at the same time, this bond could break, giving us another resonance structure. Now, which of these resonance structures is the most stable one? So we know this one is the least stable because Having a plus charge on a secondary carbon is less stable than having it on a tertiary carbon. Now, this carbocation, well, technically it's not a carbocation because it's in resonance with the bromine atom, but that carbon with the plus charge, it's not as stable as this situation here. Because whenever you have a plus charge on a carbon, it doesn't have a filled octet, so it doesn't satisfy or obey the octet rule. However, every atom in this structure does obey the octet rule. And so this is the, the major resonance structure. But the true hybrid, the true resonance hybrid, is actually between these two. So what that tells us is that to draw the resonance hybrid, it's going to look something like this. So the positive charge is actually shared between the bromine atom and the carbon atom. 
So we could say that this carbon atom has considerable partial positive charge, and the same is true for the bromine atom. So therefore, when water attacks the carbon, it's not going to attack the secondary carbon. It's going to go for the tertiary carbon because it has considerable partial positive charge. And so that's why the oxygen is going to go on the more substituted carbon of the double bond. It's going to go on the tertiary carbon and the bromine atom at the end will go on the secondary carbon. So as of now, we're going to get this intermediate. So we have an oxygen atom with a positive charge and one lone pair. And we still have the other bromine atom. So in the final step, we need to use another water molecule to take off a hydrogen. And so we're going to get our halohydrin product, which is basically an OH group and a Br atom on some type of cycloalkane. Now let's go over the stereochemistry of this reaction. So now that we understand the regiochemistry, let's talk about the stereochemistry. So we know that the OH group is going to go on the tertiary carbon. Now this reaction proceeds with anti-addition. So if the OH is on the wedge, the Br will be on the dash. And since the OH is on the wedge, the methyl group, which is attached to the same carbon, has to be on the dash. And of course, we can get the enantiomer of that product, which will look like this. It will simply have the opposite configuration. So if the Br is on the wedge, now, I mean, if it was on the dash, now it's on the wedge. So make sure you understand is that the OH group will go on the higher substituted carbon atom of the double bond, and the bromine atom will go on the less substituted carbon atom. And then these two, they must have opposite configuration because it's an anti-addition reaction. And so that's it for this video. So now you understand the mechanism behind the halogenation of alkenes, and you're familiar now with the halohydrin formation. So this is the halohydrin product, and this one as well.